Okay, welcome to the next in the series of Transforming Assessment webinars that are part of the E-Assessment Scotland series. So we're now into the second week. This session is about assessing, assessing algebra content, uh, concepts online uh, and looking at some of the potential and limitations of online delivery. Um, Associate Professor Robin Pierce is from the University of Melbourne's uh, Graduate School of Education and she'll be um, primarily running the session, but we've also got um, Professor Kay Stacey also from the Graduate School of Education here. Um, but unfortunately her microphone's not working, so she'll be able to contribute through the text chat. So Robin, I'd like to um, hand over to you to run the session. Thanks very much, Matthew. And welcome to all of those I see appearing in the box there at uh, um, various times of the day. Uh, it's good that we can get together this way. So uh, I've just noted there also one of our other colleagues, Carmen Bardini, who's also been part of preparing this presentation. And we've been working together on a project um, which this information that's been shared today you know, comes from that project. Just for those of you who, who case there are people from around the world who are just don't have a good sense of just where we are, so down here and then down here in Melbourne. But that's a little bit too because it's happened with the ones of technology. I'm in fact in Barra at the moment and uh, Kay is at her home which is on the edge of Melbourne. So, uh, and I just included a nice shot there for those of you who have visited Melbourne sometimes just to bring back your memories of South Bank, one of the popular precincts of the city. This is who we are. I haven't um, really working on putting a video into this, so you can see I'm there on the left, Carolyn in the middle, and Kay on the right, and these photos were taken at a recent conference which we hosted at the University of Melbourne. So we're in conference mode there, but that was a face to face. So this project that I mentioned is funded by the, our Australian Government's Office of Learning and Teaching, and it's, we're working with first year university mathematics students and our aim is to look at some of the key concepts that they find difficult or misconceptions that they're perhaps not aware that they have. So the stages that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, first of all something of the rationale behind the study and then looking at the, the survey that we've done which we tend to refer to sort of as a preliminary online survey because it was really just a, um, a fishing expedition trying to look at a couple of key issues because this is a pilot project we're not looking at the full scope but looking at whether we can use the student learning management system to get a sense of their understanding of some of these key issues and then to move from there to use some tests that we'll show you and I'm hoping Kay will be able to. Um, I'm just looking at the thing there. Okay. I'm not sure whether I can make this any clearer. I'm just paying attention to the text now as well. So um, if I try and slow down and enunciate more clearly, is that any better either? Okay, so the, uh, what we're hoping to, to do with the information that we've gained from these first year university students is to build some what we call smart tests, specific, specific mathematical assessments that reveal thinking and for that target these particular issues so that they might be available for the students and for their tutors to use and to get feedback and advice for teaching staff. Now I'm just saying that in overview terms now because we'll come to that in detail and show you some examples later. Our rationale for this project has been, amongst other things, a recent report from Australia's chief scientist where he has been expressing the concern that I think we're seeing in many um, Western countries particularly that students are choosing not to study the harder mathematics 
and you can see in this graph that the numbers for the senior secondary level has been holding and growing for the elementary level mathematics and so forth, but declining in the more difficult mathematics. And the proportion of students who are choosing to study mathematics and science at school and university is fairly much flat in our study. And yet it's an area that we know the information is needed. So one of the goals here in Australia is to increase students' success rate in the mathematical sciences at first year and to improve their sense of mastery and confidence so that they might have confidence to continue with their study in the mathematical sciences. It's certainly not about dumbing down the courses because that won't help. What we need to be able to do is to help students overcome any misconceptions that are blocking their learning at that stage of their university studies. So previous research, and we've done some in some different areas, even in areas like dissonance, um, and certainly out in the area of algebra, and shown that people who are apparently successful secondary school students can still harbour incorrect or incomplete conceptions of fundamental mathematical ideas. So we, uh, for anyone unfamiliar with our system here in uh, Victoria, we have, uh, the students have school-based assessment, but they also have um, high stakes final examinations in the, at the end of their second school, at the end of year 12. And students here, as I'm sure they do everywhere, practice those exam questions. Their teachers encourage them to do past papers, and practice particular types of questions, and they become adept at answering exam questions. And so when they proceed to university, it's possible that they have papered over some misconception that they've just hasn't been noticed because most of the time they're getting things right. But in fact, it may be that they have a key misunderstanding. And that's what we'd like to be able to identify in some efficient way. And it's not that these students aren't already supported in some way at the University of Melbourne and many other universities, certainly in Australia. There are learning centres in the mathematics and science statistics departments, and particularly they offer help to first year students. But it's individual assistance, it's assistance with what their topic is at the moment. Students will typically come in with their problems from that week or their assignment questions. What's not being done at the moment is broad brush diagnostic testing. Often when it is done or has been done in the past, it's really been done just to broadly inform staff, but not to look at an individual student's thinking. And essentially it's been considered to be too expensive, too time consuming, and that there's limited opportunity for individual remediation. So we've been trying to think if we can use some online means to help both do the diagnosis and provide support. So one of the things that we're really committed to is the notion of assessment for learning. That we should be using assessment to find out what students know, to diagnose what they know, to identify what the student needs to learn next. So by looking at what they know to then be able to plan the next stage, to, or to think what the key thing is that might be blocking that student moving forward, and then to have appropriate teaching that takes into account what the students have a good understanding of and what they don't. One of the issues that I was thinking about in particular with two, three mathematics is that very often tutors come from amongst the postgraduate students who are very successful in mathematics and for whom it's very difficult to look from the novice and from the learner perspective. So they're not trained teachers and what we spend our focus on with our pre-service primary and secondary teachers is to try and help them gain what is known as mathematics pedagogical content knowledge. 
how to teach mathematics in particular, how to address particular topics, how to help people who have a particular misconception recognise that, often through appropriate questions that get them some cognitive conflict and then help them move forward. So we've been trying this sort of thinking is strongly encouraged in the primary and secondary sectors. We've been trying to think about how we can move this into the tertiary sector. So in our project, uh, the aim, our primary aim at the first stage is, is to develop a current evidence base of correct or incorrect fundamental algebraic conceptions that will be prevalent amongst commencing first year undergraduate maths and stats students. So we know something about this from the literature, but often um, we, we want to remain current because as the school mathematics curriculum evolves over time, so may the thinking of students that are coming into our tertiary courses. And also as we, uh, as we see that our students come these days from a wider range of locations too, they come with different backgrounds. So we wanted to be able to look at that in some overall overview way. So we want to be able to get data first of all in this pilot project from mathematics and statistics students at the University of Melbourne. And we decided that the most, um, the least intrusive way of doing this would be if we could have uh, a survey and a quiz that went out through the university's learning management system. We want what we've been doing is backing up some of that with the think aloud interviews, and then uh, we've also introduced experienced teaching staff for their views. And as I've already started to mention, that we want to make innovative use of technology to produce in this pilot project just some sample smart tests that will add a different dimension to the assessment of learning that has been offered for first year students before. And part of that will be not just having online quizzes that can diagnose students thinking, but providing feedback. So we already have experience with providing feedback to teachers and we've been working more recently on providing feedback also to adult students in one of our other courses in the pre service teaching course. So at this stage we limited our project to algebra and that's because we needed to put some very narrow bounds on a one year pilot project and we know from the literature and from our own teaching experience that key areas where students have misconceptions that last a long time are uh, they're looking at their understanding of variables and unknowns or per and parameters and the notion of functions. Uh, functions are really key things through the secondary mathematics course and through into social studies. So, it's something which we thought they should have some understanding of. How did you identify these hotspots? That's a good question. So we identified these common hotspots to, to focus on in this preliminary study, both from the literature and from our own teaching experience, uh, because as it happens, we've got experience also of not only teaching, working in the mathematics education field, but in mathematics. So uh, both Caroline and I have taught the first classics for the first year mathematics courses and I hadn't actually mentioned before we have uh, another colleague from the mathematics department, Deborah King, who is the coordinator of first year mathematics at the University of Melbourne. So if we, in this presentation, if we look at functions and something what we were looking at there, we wanted to look to see whether students could verbalise their understanding of functions, if they could define and describe them in their own words, remembering that most of these students were expecting to have started, been introduced to the concept probably at something like year eight, and it's become more formalised and expanded through the use of secondary mathematics. So we would hope that at the beginning of the tertiary studies that they would be able to actually explain this idea. 
uh, if you can read that, they should be able to recognise functions in multiple representations. In, here in Victoria, technology is permitted in the final examinations. Most of our Victorian students will have experience of using computer algebra systems, and so we're hoping that they're very familiar with algebraic, graphic, and generic representations of functions. And thirdly, that the students should be able to manipulate functions, that they should be able to substitute values and do calculations with, with symbols. So our online quiz was just through the learning management system. So it looks like this. What we did was to arrange that every student who was enrolled in the first year mathematics or statistics subject in the first semester was also given access to an online community. And we set up the quiz and survey within the online community. So the advantage of this was that it's widely used. Our students have to access all of their subjects and uh, through the learning management system it's used as a repository for the recorded lectures, for their tutorial documents, the discussions, for resources. It's the standard point to which they go. So quite familiar to them. So there's no extra burden on in terms of them becoming familiar with a new technology. It's possible for us to link to the students' information because it comes across to us with their names. And uh, it offers a variety of types of assessment, anonymous surveys and quizzes. So in fact, this was, for our research purpose, slightly tricky because having anonymous surveys when we wanted to match that information up with your test results didn't work very well. So one of the first hurdles to overcome was to be able to write our survey, which was taking demographic data and background on their use of technology and their background in mathematics. We had to set it up in a test format so that we could match up the results with their mathematics quiz results. Just a slight sort of um, pick up for us at the beginning. So it meant some of the format of questions used in the survey might not have been our first choice, but that didn't cause any problem for the students. The other advantage of this uh, system is that it allows you to import or export the results from directly to Excel. So it's not in a nice cleaned up form, but the results are all there and with a few hours of work they can be uh, easily sorted, uh, ordered, counted, searched. In this quiz, we only allowed the students one attempt. It was set with a limited time, so they, at 35 minutes it would close, and they were not able to use to, to go in twice um, once they actually started attempting it. So the aim was to be the aim was for this to be um, encouraged students to do it quite quickly because we were trying to get their conceptual understanding. We were not trying to work out what they could do if they sat down with pen and paper for an hour. We wanted their quick reactions to just see what their, um, their key conceptual thinking was on these questions. And the uh, technology allowed us to track the number of access, accesses with or without attempts, the date, the time, and the duration. And we were interested in that because it was quite helpful to know if a student had done the quiz very quickly. Uh, that may indicate that they were quite competent at doing it, or um, if the student spent the full 35 minutes, it might indicate a lack of time if we could see that it was clear that they hadn't actually finished all of the items. One of the disadvantages of using a system which is it's a bit like using a multi-wrench tool uh, and finding it doesn't fit every situation as well as you might like is that the math editor is limited in the uh, editing program to which, which the uh, learning management system gave us access. So if we wanted to do 
if you think about mathematics, one of its perennial problem, but that mathematics is not just written in a linear form, it's in fact two dimensional when we write it. So let me just go to the next slide and you'll see what I'm talking about. So the first couple of items aren't too bad, they can be done with the editor, but once we get to the ones where we need simultaneous equations or where we're describing the function using what's called a hybrid function where it's got three different rules to define different parts of the function in that middle one, then we, we've got to set that out in more than one dimension and so it becomes um, a bit of a, a task and it's without it. Um, so I'll show you, and somebody's just asking if they were all multiple response. Uh, no, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, just the issue with this in some layer, and because you didn't have a CAS, a computer algebra system, underneath it, which the sophisticated packages that online has, then it meant that these had to be constructed in Word and turned into images and imported in. So it, it restricted what you could do with it. So these, yes, were set up as multiple choice. Well, really just a dichotomous select, don't need any multiple choice, are they a function or not, click on the ones that are. So there wasn't much flexibility and in fact even in terms of the multiple choice, we couldn't have multiple choice within a question. So if we look at a question like this, which is a, has been set up with some sophistication in SMART, uh, but it's here mm -hmm. there were drop down boxes where there was multiple choice on each one. When we converted that for our purposes, we turned them into dichotomous responses so that they just chose in each case which answer applied. And an item like this one where we in fact when we see it on a you know, paper form, it's all on one screen and it's just a, you know, it could be filled with gaps with writing, but this was not possible within the um, restrictions of the system we were using. And so this meant reframing that single item as four items where there was a multiple choice for each possibility. So um, it made it longer instead of it added length, even though you know, there was a message that said you know, these four are all related, it still means that students are looking carefully to see if it's the same students each time, etc. However, um, despite that, uh, we could export the data in Excel and rearrange, as I said, and look at that. And the other issue was from the student's perspective, there was no maths editor available for them. So if they wanted to put in, when we wanted some open responses, which we did use, then they had to type, instead of being able to write an X squared with a superscript, they had to write with a Coretta with two, which it just means there's um, even more possibilities for making typing errors and not recognising them because it's not the format that they usually see then they see and from our perspective it's much slower to read. And for something when we wanted in this particular item that's here when we wanted to see whether they could look at this if of f of x, we had to try and reduce the complexity of the question so that they could do that. So you can see the way some of the data came through to us on the open response questions items and this is, it takes uh, quite a bit of looking at to try and recognise where the correct or incorrect or the patterns of errors etc. You can see the first one that's been circled there where there's an at symbol which we could look and see quite easily as a typo because if we look at the keyboard we can see the at and the two are on the one key. So we could look at that. Uh, in the next one, we were uh, looking at ones where they hadn't expanded the whole equation, uh, various representations of the way we have given this, but uh, it's, uh, 
not simple, and in terms of actually sorting through these and seeking for correct and incorrect answers, we had a bit under bit less than 400 students who actually answered the quiz. And I mean, that's an issue too for online questions where you've got really little way of encouraging them and chasing them up. There's something like 2,000 students enrolled in those first two mathematics subjects, 400 actually. This is not too bad when it was a really little immediate interest to them. But uh, you know, to try and sort through and find out how they were going was a bit of a task. So despite the limitations, it, it did provide a quick support for our purposes where we just wanted to get a sense of which were the issues that stuck out as the priorities to address for our students. So what we discovered was that the misconceptions reported in the literature from about 1990 are still prevalent despite all the intervening years and efforts. And just to show you a couple of examples, if we look at uh, what was an open response question where students were asked to define and describe the function in their own words, what we did was to read and reread the answers, do some classifying of what was a key themes and then look for key words that we could search on in order to see how many students were giving each type of response. So we can see there that if we look at the bottom up figure, then 60% of students gave at least one valid statement and half of the students in the middle of the top they mentioned that functions involved a rule. But uh, to our surprise, in fact, only 4% of the students mentioned the vertical line test, which we thought was commonly mentioned in secondary schools. So this has given us some information about the uh, ideas that are part of uh, the concept of function that really weren't in the mind of these students. And secondly, in questions which were automatically marked, it was simple to see what percentage of students were correctly responding, and we can see there where the hotspots stick out. That the hybrid continuous function wasn't recognised by many students as being a function. So it just gives us some quick feedback to look at where we should address our tests. So for the automatically marked items, the number correct, the items correct and incorrect showed up. So we don't get any diagnosis of misconceptions. Of course, we just get some basic correct and incorrect results. And any advice which is based on just a score, which we could students could be given a score on the test, but that would be very vague and really not much use to the student because the issue is not really how many questions they've got right. What we're trying to do is to see if they've got a key misconception and that may be blocking their way forward. And that may be shown up just by a pair of items that they have given an incorrect response to. It's not a matter of giving how many they get right, but which combination of questions they answer correctly. So we could do better with a more sophisticated system, and there's been a good conversation going on the side there, thank you, Kay, about other possible systems. And uh, but we want to develop tests that are targeted to these prevalent and complete or incorrect conceptions that the students have. And so we wanted to be able to make use of smart tests. Now, Kay, have you got sound? Can I hand over to you, Kay? I'm just trying to see if Kay would like to speak. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, in this section, we're going to describe um, the form of assessment that we've been trialling in schools and really as a system for testing children and sending results back to their teachers. And we also have a version of it where we can um, we can test test students and send the results back to adult students. 
So it's a slight variation of our of the SMART test that we have for, for children. Okay, so Robin, are you able to change the slide? Great. So this is one of our SMART test examples, and this is from a test that we have for um, students in about well year eight, year nine, or year ten, um, and. What we're trying to do in these tests is really look at conceptual thinking. So we've taken items from the large bank of mathematical education research questions and tried to turn them into something that will diagnose student teaching, student thinking. So in this one, we're looking for common misconceptions amongst school children and possibly also amongst university students that. Um, they think, for example, that if you have x plus y equals 16, the x and the y have to be different. You can, or perhaps the x has to be smaller than the y, or maybe the x has to be one different to the y. Y might be the, the, the number after x. So those are the sorts of things we're looking for in an item like this. And for various reasons, we've used these drop-down menus in the SMART tests, which are not ideal, uh, for, um, but in fact it seemed to, for us it was the easiest way to do it. Okay, next slide, Robin. Yes, I, I can, I do have the extra smart test slide for you to share if you'd like that. Um, would it be better just to have, um, I think maybe it's easier just to, ha to have a look here. We could look at, at the site in a moment. Um, these are the sorts of things that we're doing. What we've actually got um, is we take all of these students' answers and we actually have written pro little programs that analyse the exact answer that students give and then we put them together so that um, we can actually diagnose how particular students are thinking by the actual answers they're given, not just by patterns of right or wrong, but actually the type of answers that they're giving and looking across tests. So that's been an extremely complicated thing to do um, and what we're hoping to do is then is to diagnose the thinking of students in two ways. One through these stages, so we're trying to tell teachers in a, for each of their students immediately after the student has finished the test what stage they're up to and eventually we hope that you know, with the university students we'd be able to do the same thing but giving them the feedback rather than in this case giving feedback to, actual, to teachers. So in this case we've written our stages that are related to how students think about algebraic letters and it comes from those questions you just saw plus a number of other items. Um, we've also got these teaching suggestions which we haven't really um, polished up. We've, we haven't got a huge amount of um, funding for that part of the project. We're trying in fact to get teaching suggestions that relate to each of the different stages. Sometimes these are the same but very often they're different in trying to say what sort of activities would actually move students along from one to the other. And one of the challenges in the university project is trying to give things for students to understand themselves. If they're at you know, say stage two, how can they, un you know, we we'd be able to need to talk to them about moving to stage three, which is different to talking to a teacher who already knows. And then as Robin's got, because we built this on, um, by taking questions out of the maths education research literature, of course the references are important. Next slide, Robin. Okay. Um, so I guess that's it. Yeah, so we're trying to look at the hotspots for the start of university mathematics. Unfortunately, we think they will still be very similar to the some of the hotspots that we find in year nine, year ten. As Robin is saying, we think that um, as students progress, it's quite often fundamental misunderstandings get sort of papered over rather than fixed so that we think that students actually, um, a lot of students, who, although they can actually sort of go through the hoops quite well at year 12, 
say, to get to Melbourne University, they're fairly good students. Um, we do think that there's quite a lot of fundamental misunderstandings that they really still haven't sorted out. And those things make mathematics very hard to understand. If you don't really want to um, know what to um, do out there. Okay, so as Robin's got here, uh, this project is still completing. Okay. So I'm just going to go to the site so that people can see. Okay, and I, have I got, um, are you there or am I there at the moment? So for example we could go to uh, values for letters, there, quiz A, don't know whether this will show up, yeah, preview the quiz. Okay, so it's very small, it's come out very small on my writing, but uh, on my screen. Um, but what we've got here is the top question is d equals 4 and a equals 5, so d plus a equals, so this is partly just if students can't get this right then we actually wouldn't necessarily even look very far um, in, in the next year, so they're not doing basic substitution. And here we've got c and d and we're looking for the 3 and the 4 there, one different. Um, and here the 6 and the 1 are, the 6 is bigger than the, than the 1 and they're not, just D isn't the number after C. So if students were picking that one as wrong, the, um, C plus D equals 7, then we'd be at looking for, to see if they also did that in other parts of the test because we want to look at misconceptions that are quite, um, that are consistent, not something that's just accidentally tripped them up once or twice. So those items are not easy to replace. Yeah, you know, we've actually, they're very carefully designed. The next one I think is the one that we already, it's very much like the one we saw before, uh, x plus x plus x equals 12, the same sort of marking there. Um, was quite interesting. Um, so what we do there, Robin, are you trying to get them all right? <laughs> I'm just clicking, um, really. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that we had the last one there. We got we trialled these a lot with students, and we found quite a lot of students who didn't want x equals four, but they wanted x equals four and x equals four and x equals four. So that's a beginning stage. And Sally's asked how much we've analysed the school children's answers. Well, to some extent an enormous amount and to some extent there's always more analysis that you can do. Every time we look at a new topic, we have about um, tests on about 60 topics. Every time you do it, we discover um, really interesting things about new topics. So um, we've got some space ones, we've got measurements there. Uh, then we've got a lot of number, which is probably our most used section. Yeah. So I think altogether there's about 60 there. <laughs> yeah, I understand about the comment of drowning in data. Um, our problem is too that we. Yeah, we write, we have to have these stages of learning, so we try to um, use this, first of all we really go for our gut feeling and from the research for the stages of learning, but then when we get some data, then we really try to analyse it and see if the stages fit, and then, um, yeah, so we actually have to analyse the data quite quickly there as part of our um, as our test development because we've got people using them sort of every day. We're still trying to analyse fractions this week. Again. <laughs> Shall I go over to, back over to you, Robin? Yes, well, I think it's over to anybody else who'd like to ask us anything about either with the university students or with the smart tests and their development at the moment with uh, school students. But, uh, Extension of that uh, work as we can with the test for students. Okay. 
So I guess I'm asking Matthew if it's a people people want to speak, is it through you, Matthew? I was just going to suggest if people wanted to um, ask a question via the microphone, they're welcome to do that. Um, if you can raise your hand using the little hand symbol at the top, so we know that you want to ask a question. If not, just please continue to type the questions into the um, text. Uh, whilst the people are thinking of their questions, um, I'm putting up the uh, feedback survey for the session. So if people could please fill in that survey by clicking the link on the screen. Uh, it's actually a live link, so if you click that, the survey will appear in your browser. Otherwise, let's continue with the question and answers. Now you might like to talk to Tim's question. Yes. So how do we? Uh, so Tim has asked how we create the questions and how we do the analysis system and what is the technology behind it. Uh, so we actually use. Um, we started. We did start off using Moodle. Um, I know someone else um, suggested that, and in fact we found. So we started about five years ago. We found the Moodle was. Not very. Um, it was very good. We used it as our development to begin with, but we had trouble using it in a wide range of schools, and it was slow. And we also, I think, it was because the students needed to get back to the Moodle site. I might be wrong there. So we actually eventually swapped to um, Ajax, which is a a, um, yeah, a, a web-based uh, programming. Um, um, what programming language, isn't it? Um, so we've got, we've built ourselves um, a, an interface for programming the diagnosis, which is really a, a major thing. I, and I, I know Matthew said Moodle's come a long way in five years, and I agree with it, but I, I know that. Unfortunately, you can't swap back. Um, uh, yeah, so it's not that we didn't like. Moodle. It's just that at the time, if we had um, a, a class next, another class in the school, say doing graphic design or something, we just um, we couldn't we couldn't do with it. Also, bandwidth has improved, so um, we write our own programs and we've written our own interface for writing them. And as it, this is a real problem, you know, being custom coded. It also means that our questions are a little bit inflexible, like if we change the question, we really need to do it. But the, de the items are very carefully analysed. For example, um, we have a lot of items about estimation, and students might um, pull a slider to indicate how big something is. And that means we actually have to convert that from pixels, you know, various different pixels will have, it will be different in the um, in the coding, um, so it's certainly a complicated thing. I mean, with the misconceptions, I guess that just builds on our research over many, many years that we've done. So, Robin, you're having a look at um, what are you? I just thought at? I didn't, we didn't show any sliders. Sorry. Which test should I go to for the sliders? Um, or the drag and drop? Um, I'm not sure. Just on Smart Vic, you might not be able to. Um, um, if you just, if you go to, uh, I'm just not sure which ones are actually on Smart Vic. Smart Vic's our free site. We've also got two paying sites. If you go to Space Robin and then just have a look at Reflection, and just see if the drag and drop works there. We don't have them all necessarily loaded just onto this this site. Okay, so Robin, can you drag and drop? Take that yellow. Can you just take that yellow spot and drag it and put it? Well done. Bit close. Yeah. 
So that's a drag and drop, for example, and we're analysing where that goes. So, for example, a lot of people, yes, that's about where a lot of people would put it, Robin. That's good, yep. But if, so don't worry, so a misconception, a lot of kids, for example, can do the horizontal ones and not the others. Could you just go ahead and just do a few next, Robin, and then go through to the fish? Yeah, like that one. Just, um, yeah, just pick up that fish and put it in there. So um, that's another form of drag and drop. We think these are quite engaging, really. Um, it's, it's, and you, there's all sorts of ways you can sort of learn how to try to do it. You might like to have a look at one of the harder fish questions. So that one's fairly difficult. So what, what we're trying to do here is to work, find out you know, can the basic stages will be that students um, can do the horizontal and vertical, um, and then they. And in fact, we know we've looked at our data. Students can do the horizontal and vertical with simple or complex shapes, and then they can do just this, the very simple shapes when the fold line isn't vertical or horizontal, and then finally getting the complex shapes, of course, is the last stage. But with horizontal and vertical things, it's almost as easy to do a complex shape as a simple shape. So that's a mathematical, um, that's about reflection. And then here we can see, we can, but unfortunately what's happened here, our difficulty, and in a sense what makes it not a commercial product, is that we have to program these pixel by pixel. You know, so different, and then we're looking for the errors, where those errors are. You know, so if, if you're putting it too far away, you know, horizontally rather than, rather than um, perpendicularly across the fold line, Turn back to you, Robin. Okay. I'll just finish this off again. Yeah, so uh, I mean I guess our vision um, is that we might be able to develop something like this but for tertiary students so that they can get the feedback or that this feedback, I mean I have visions that you could have something like this available in the learning centre as many universities have for their first year students that when a student comes in and is asking for help with this assignment it may be that the tutor says well just sit down and spend five minutes doing these couple of online quizzes first and so it gives that tutor some immediate feedback that tells them whether the student actually has the fundamental concepts that are underpinning the tasks that they need to do, or whether in fact they're harbouring or have been papering over some misconception that needs to be addressed because it'll always get in the way of them moving into um, higher level mathematics. Um, and that there'd be that sort of feedback quickly to the tutor, and with you know, perhaps a quick suggestion to them as to the sort of thing that take sort of question, the style of question that the student needs to be asked to create some cognitive concept to help them move forward. Or, as Kay was saying, perhaps we can manage some feedback for the student themselves. In terms of the interviews I've done with students, I've had mixed feedback. One student said, well, if it was, they were just available to students, that they could check those things themselves, that they wouldn't do it. Um, another student said, oh yes, I'd do everything that they gave me to try and help. So students are people, it'll depend on their, their individual response to guess how much they can get out of something like this. So I'll try to look at the questions here. Or over to UK to answer them is those further ones about SMART.
I just I thought we might have answered. Um, it's obviously interesting to see the comments about the learning catalytics. I'll have a look at it up, um, after afterwards. Um, but I think we've answered those of the these smart questions, haven't we? Yes. So there are obviously a range of systems out there, and what I think is interesting is, um, in its case, comment that you know, what's looking like a really useful system now has been being worked on for quite a number of years, and I guess we've got a number of these around the world, and we only really discover them now that they've been going for a while. But it's, um, I guess this is, it's, you know, it takes quite a while to develop these things because for, it, for teachers and students to actually want to use them, there has to be a lot of tests and a lot of feedback available. That uh, creates an issue. Okay. You have your um, hand up. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that what we've tried to do, um, and in fact what's really developed for us in the time, is a change in the format of questions. So our, um, the original question you saw you know, about the X plus Y equals 16 is very text based. And what we've tried to do now is to write questions that are a lot more sort of graphical graphically based and you know, now we've got drag and drop. We've actually got some animated diagrams now. Um, so we think that probably the on online assessment doesn't have to be like paper and pencil assessment and also students don't treat it like paper and pencil um, assessment. In fact they don't think that they won't work things out on a piece of paper and then come back and type it in. So their behaviour is quite different. And we've tried to get more and more. We're trying to get items that really, um, you know, are able to be done sort of on the screen. And so I think for conceptual understanding, that's fine. There's a lot of things though that you, in mathematics that you can't assess that way. Uh, and there's also a question here about can we capture information about how they derive an answer, regardless of it's correct or incorrect. Um, so for the SMART test is that we've tried to use items, we use interviews, we watch students do it, um, yeah, and we've also used things from very detailed studies in the research literature. So I think very often we do know how students do it. Um, sometimes we have um, blank spaces where we ask them to write how they do it and then we'll take those out. Uh, that just gives us some feedback, and then we remove. They're not actually used for the diagnosis. Um, but um, basically, I think by the time we get to the smart tests, we pretty much know what we're looking for. Although always some something interesting. There's always something interesting that comes up. Yeah, and Matthew's just said that there was a math system that allows step-by-step -step tracking of math problems. So, for example, the um, uh, Freudenthal Institute have written, I think it's called DME. That's a nice one. You can do step by step. Um, and these are, um, so they've generally got a computer algebra system behind them. And um, they're looking actually to check the manipulation and those sorts of things. So that's a little bit different to diagnosing conceptual understanding. I see some information coming up here in the chat list. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Robin Kay, I will um, send the chat log to you so that you can have those links that you can look up later if you like. Thank you. I mean, we I do know about some of the some of these things. Um, yeah, that it's um, 
so the particularly the assessment of university mathematics you know there's been a lot of development on that that particularly for the US market I think you know, so they've had some they've got some very big systems there uh, I don't think there's any what we try to do is to look across items and then diagnose it really for the teacher and I think that's a different focus Okay, um, we're just about at the hour, so it's um, 6 p.m. here in Eastern Australia um, and probably coming up towards 10, I think, in the UK. So we probably better close off the session. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here. If people would like to stick around, you're welcome to. Um, just like to formally thank uh, Robin and Kay for their wonderful talk and the very interesting demonstration of their live system. So thank you very much. Thank you.